Welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here. My name is Amy Weisberg. I'm the director of the library. Nice to see so many of you here. We have some people on Zoom as well, and we'll be recording this talk so that you can view it later on our website. Um, so we're really pleased to have Greg Humphrey here to give a talk about the history of the Northeast Harbor Golf Club. Um, he just uh, published a book entitled uh, Far and Shore, the Northeast Harbor Golf Club. Um, so he has some copies available um, for sale tonight as well. Um, so he'll tell you a lot about the history, and I just wanted to mention that um, Greg Humphrey is a retired educator from Weybridge, Vermont. Um, he taught at Middlebury College for many years um, and local area schools there. Um, he began playing golf with the Northeast Harbor Golf Club in 1978 when it was a 15 hole layout. So it's a lot of history with this um, golf club. And again, thank you all for being here tonight. <laughs> So I thought I'd start by explaining that this book is a, it's a genre book. It's called a club book. And a lot of uh, golf courses have their own club books. I noticed years ago we didn't, we didn't have one. So I've always wanted to put it together and I'm pleased that it came out as, as nicely as it, as it has. But, uh, and it's not just all the club books. I, right, Jim? <laughs> they have tennis clubs that have books and other clubs, but it is a genre. And as such, um, they mainly, the first half or so is usually the history of the club. And then the second half of the book is every hole on the current club and some tips on how to play it and some of it, of the, uh, you know, the statistics on the hole. So that that's what club books are all about. And uh, now we have one and I've entitled it far and sure, and you'll see why in, a, in just a second. I thought also in putting together a book like this, it takes a lot of people, not just me writing. And I wanna make sure that I give credit to some of those people. Um, first and foremost, here at the library, uh, their archivist, uh, Daniela Achatura, was incredibly helpful to both Margo and myself by finding um, documents we didn't know existed, old newspapers, photographs. So I wanted to thank her personally. Um, also, Tamara Rose, who is on the board at the golf club, but who is a tireless helper in terms of, if I needed her to find something for the book, she would find it. She can surf the internet like no one else. <laughs> and I really want to thank Margo. There would be no book without her work. We work together. For a couple of years putting it all together. I also want to thank Justin Small. Justin used to be the club manager. And I, I remember I told him that I was interested in writing a book and he said, come here. And he took me to a back room and under lock and key, he brought out these two piles of papers. Just piles. There was no order to them. There was nothing but papers strewn in these two big boxes that had a lock and key. And he allowed me to take the boxes uh, back and slowly but surely I put them in order and then I started reading what was there. And, and that's how I helped put it together. But thank you, Justin, for giving me the permission to have all the files such as they were. Some of the files were given to um, the Mount Desert Historical Society. So I wanna make sure that I thank them for allowing me to take this box that was housed there, and to have found the original ledger book from 1960. And ledger books are wonderful for historians because you're following the money. You're seeing who was paid for what. <laughs> and that sealed the deal on who we paid to actually build our first real nine holes, et cetera, et cetera. So I want to thank the Mount Desert Historical Society for allowing me to do that. I also want to thank Chad Curley, who used to be the chief pro, for allowing me to interview him. It took hours. I said, Chad, 
tell me the best way to play a role on this golf course. <laughs> and he did. And we put that in the second half of the book. To, you, the best strategy. Of course, I find myself almost impossible to do what he says. I try, oh goodness, I try, but so thanks to Chad. I also want to thank Cliff Staples. Cliff was the groundskeeper during the time when the final three holes were finished to take the course once again back to 18 holes. It had been 15 holes um, for quite a long time. And then finally they restored the last three holes thanks to Cliff and his crew. And so Cliff allowed me to use old photographs that he took back then, which I was able to put in the book. Um, and he also loves to be to take photographs. To, to this day, it's his passion. So he came to the club and, and we rode around and he took tremendous photographs of each and every hole. Margo took a lot of photographs as well. And between them, I was able to, to fulfill the second half of the book and the cover. One of Margo's shots. No, that's one of Cliff's shots, but on the back is one of Margo's shots. And so thank you, Cliff, enormously. Um, I also want to thank. Um, Bill Trimble, who was the former president of the club, for giving me a green light to go ahead and do it. Um, I want to thank uh, Jim Stevens for turning me on to a great printer out of Boston, printing company called the Millennium Printing Corporation. He had previously worked with them. They turned out to be fabulous. Really easy to work with, very supportive. Anything I decided needed to be in the book. They, I ran it through them and they they sealed the deal. They're really a great company. So I wanted to thank them. My my proofreader, my good friend from Middlebury College days, when I went there, Linda Watson was my proofreader. Her daughter, Georgia Wright, was the designer of the book. So that was pretty nice. I also um, need to thank my wife, Susan, mama, who doesn't play golf. <laughs> Did you hear that, Susan? I think she's on the Zoom as we speak. So, to get started with the slideshow, I, I just chose some images from the book that I particularly like, uh, and hopefully I'll be able to fit it in in the time span. Um, and we'll see if this works. There it is, there we go. All right, first and foremost, there's our wonderful emblem, a tree with the expression foreign here. So I found out that the expression foreign cure came from Scotland. It was used for hundreds of years. You know, they've been playing golf in Scotland you know, 500 years at least before it came slowly to the United States at the turn of the century, 18, 1880 to, to 1900, it started to grow. And, and foreign cure, when you wrote a letter to another friend who played golf, you didn't sign it sincerely, Greg. You signed it far and fair, Greg. It was also used as an expression. There's a movie called Tommy's Honor, great golf movie. It takes place in St. Andrews with old Tom Morris and his son, young Tom Morris. And uh, at the very beginning of the movie, he's waking his son up. Laddie, laddie, far and fair, far and fair. Meaning, get up so we can play golf. <laughs> That's what it meant. And so it, it takes on a lot of different meaning. Um, and I also put in the book a very fairly long poem by a Scotsman named, according to my source, The Late Sheriff Logan. And the name of the poem is Far and Sure. I'm just going to read you a couple verses. Far and sure was the cry of our fathers, was the cry which their forefathers heard. Is the cry of their sons when the muttering gathers. When we're gone, may it still be the word. Far and sure, there is honor and hope in the sound. Long over these links, may it roll. It will, oh, it will, for each face around shows its magic is felt in each soul. Let it guide us in life at the desk or the bar. It will shield us from folly and gay lure. And it still goes on, but... What you need to know about the expression is that um, the Scots believe that the way you play golf is kind of the way you live your life. 
So if you're one of these people that don't like your lie, you take your foot and you kind of <laughs> give it a better lie, that's how you treat life here at theater. And it comes out on the golf course. And so this foreign tour is sort of bigger than all of us, but it's a wonderful expression. And it was first, according to my research, it came to the United States through a man who you'll meet in the book in the slideshow, Charles Blair McDonald, C.B. McDonald, who used the expression as the Chicago Country Club's mind. And our man, Mr. Thorpe, who you'll also hear about, went and competed at his club in Chicago. And my theory is that he brought it back with him after he competed. It was still in the 1890s. It would have been about 1897. So when we first started in 1895, I don't, I'm saying it probably wasn't that expression, but then it became our motto ever since. And I'm attributing it to Thorpe, the guy who started our club. Okay. See if this works. There, at the Northeast Harbor Golf Club, a young man by the name of Jackson DeWitch Clement took these aerial shots on his drone camera. And I've never met him in person, but I certainly emailed him and asked permission to put these in the book. And he happily gave me permission to do that. But it's a wonderful shot of some of the holes of the club. And I was able to put it right. on the front and the back covers of the book. And I like it so much because it shows it shows what's there on some sound. You can't quite see it, but Paul Corey is up in here. And it turns out that some of the people who were Corey men were from Scotland. Oh, wow. Yes. And uh, they found their way over it. To this parcel of land when there weren't all those trees there. Uh, but it's a beautiful shot with Jackson took. And then the one on the back cover, I like this even better because you can see somebody's dock here. But in the early days, the golf club rented a dock here and paid for it up until the 1930s. So that remember when the roads were pretty bad when the horse and buggies. In the mud and everything, people took their their boats to the golf course. And our founder, who lived out here on Greeny Island, he had a boat that took him back and forth as well. And so that's why I like that. And I like the fact that I can see soon, can see Greeny Island. It's just looking at different directions up and down the sound. So thank you, Jackson, for doing that. And now we're going to see what the uh, before there was even a golf course. This part of the Corson family land was known as the Northeast Harbor Golfing Grounds. There it is. And you can see Acadia Mountain in the background. But, and you can see the Corson's house right there. Mr. and Mrs. Corson allowed, allowed people, I'm thinking maybe some of the Scotsmen brought a club or two with them, a ball or two with them. And they came to one of the flattest areas of the island. I mean, there's not many flat areas to play golf on Mount Desert Island, but this was one of them. And despite the, uh, let's say, cow pies, <laughs> they still were able to shoot their balls back and forth and practice their game on the Northeast Harbor golfing grounds slash Mr. and Mrs. Fox Horses land. So uh, I thought that was a, uh, an interesting photograph. All right. Here we have Joseph Gordon Thorpe Jr. and his wife, Anne Allegra Longfellow Thorpe, also known as Pansy. And um, when I found out that he was married to a Longfellow, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's daughter. I did some, some searching, and it turns out that they have a house. They had a house on Brattle Street in Boston, about two blocks up from Harvard Square. It also turns out that this house was used by George Washington during the Revolutionary War. That's how old the house is. 
and that it's now a national museum because of the Washington connection. But in the basement of this house, the Longfellow archives exist. And I found this out and went down, this was just before COVID, and was able to meet with some archivists. And the archivist brought out a box of letters. That's what she had. Probably 25 letters or so. Each one written by Mr. Thorpe back to his wife when he was competing in golf around the country. Uh, each letter. And I scanned them. And his handwriting is so awful <laughs> that even my wife who taught handwriting <laughs> I tried to once too when I taught fourth grade, not very good, but uh, but we can't translate a lot of them. We'll get there, but it takes forever to figure it out. His handwriting is that bad. But I have the letters all scanned. Perhaps that'll be the next book. Uh, what's interesting, Letitia Baldwin was writing in the Bar Harbor Times years ago. She talked about a story of this couple hiking the hills of Acadia. They were one of my favorite words, rusticating. <laughs> they were called rusticators. They were being rustic, if you will. And they looked out over the water, she says, between northeast and southwest, and they saw Greening Island. And they saw some sheep grazing on the island in an open field. And immediately, Joe Thorpe said, oh, I could build my own golf course on that <laughs> island. <laughs> that's what he thought of golf. He saw these beautiful sheep. So... That's what they did. He bought half the island. They built a beautiful house, which you'll see in a second. And he built his own golf course. It had nine holes, but only six greens. So some of the greens were used for more than one hole. Uh -huh. And um, <laughs> he was a Harvard-trained lawyer from Boston and an avid, self-taught golfer. Um, and in fact, uh, remarkably, he didn't start playing golf to his late 30s into his early 40s. But he was good enough to win many club tournaments in the Boston area. So he was in love with golf. And in that first box of letters, in that one box of letters, in the very first letter I opened up, this is what I found. A telegram. Uh, a telegram from Southampton where Joe is competing in the second U.S. amateur golf tournament ever held. And he wanted his wife to know that he beat the champion this morning, three up, two to play, Elster's J.G. Thorpe. Now, it's a telegram. First thing you notice is that his name is spelled wrong. There's no E on the name of it, but the telegraph officer, or whoever wrote it down, didn't know that. You see 1896, that's the, uh, that's the date of the second amateur. And here what he does is he beats not only the champion, but he, meets, he beats this guy, C.B. McDonald, the C.B. McDonald, in the very first match that he played. It was the round of 32. You had to qualify, and you handed in a score, and they locked off the, the bet 32 scores, and then they put them in brackets. And it goes, you know, 32, 16, 8, 4, 2, 1. And he won, and he wanted his wife to know. And Elster's is short for the Norwegian I love you, because that's where they honeymooned, with the Norway. And uh, so I kind of said, I'm on to something here. I found this telegraph about this famous call from McDonald, and our guy, J.G. Thorpe, So that's pretty cool. How did you determine this first man? I love you. Uh, I asked the archivist, and it actually, it's an expression, the real expression is Jeg, Elster, Deg, and put it together, and he says Elster's. But there, the archivist at that museum told me what that was. And then subsequently, I looked it up, and it's, you can find it. Um, so this is his scorecard for his actual courts out there in Green. Who knew? Um, it's a lovely scorecard. First of all, Ravensthorpe, he named his course. That's a great name for a course with a little raven up there. And also, I mean, it had some significant holes on it. There's two, 312 yards on the 322. 
He named each of the each of the holes, which is great, pool and windmill, wild roses. And also he's got this curious, the way he keeps score back then, it's called the Bowie score. I wish they still did this. <laughs> so in other words, here's a hole of 229 yards, which in today would be a part three. But the bogey score was a four. And remember the equipment they were playing with. Yeah. I mean, you could, they were not, it's not like putting over smooth greens. The putt, you, you had to really push it through high grass to get to the hole. <laughs> so a bogey score makes sense that in some were pars, just because they're short par threes, they still expected you to get a par on that. Um, his great-granddaughter wrote a letter to Rob Gardner, who used to be the pro at, at the course, in which he remembers um, that it was great fun for a four-year-old like me to put a tee, which was sand and water, on every hole. You reached in, you got some wet sand, and you put it down so they could put their balls on the teams. And that was her job back then, to do that. <laughs> but also, she remembered when she found a lost ball, selling it back to them for 10 cents. <laughs> yeah, from the Ravens for course. Then, there's a picture, as tough as it is, of Joe. Swinging his glove. Um, one way and another. Uh, back when he was competing in that second U.S. amateur, the New York Sun, uh, New York Sun newspaper, reported on the semifinal match. Now he's made it all the way through to the semifinal. So there's, there's four four people left, and he was playing another American named Mr. Toller. And the, the New York Sun says, "Quote: Mr. Thorpe has played baseball, tennis, and cricket." and has not got the correct golf form. But this does not make any difference to him, for he has the aforementioned get there form. He'll get it there, that's, what I, that's how I do it, it's my get there form. Some have said about him, the quote, it's a wonder he does not jerk his head off the way he drives. Well, his head is still on, and he defeated Taller in clever shape. There's, there you go. And here is C.B. McDonald, the man himself. Uh, I have a book written by a man named George Bacco, who is called The Evangelist of American Golf, and that's a great name for C.B. McDonald. He was an evangelist in, in, in that he, he spread golf everywhere he went. He was so in love with the game. His family had sent him over to St. Andrews when he was just a lad, he was a teenager. And he played golf with all the greats at that time. And then when he came back to the United States, he, uh, he was a fervent, fervent amateur, meaning that he could not make any money from golf. He formed a company, and that company built still some of the most like, iconic golf courses in North America. He, um, he built Yamens Hall, Charleston. He built the National Golf Links. He built Yale, the Yale course. Mm -hmm. Mid-ocean course in Bermuda. Mm -hmm. He built Shinnecock Hills, Piping Rock, Sleepy Hollow, and the Greenbrier, among others. He also built the first 18-hole course in America, called the Chicago Country Club, the one that has Park here. He was a bombastic man in every aspect. Very difficult man. Uh, it was his way of the high. Uh, he founded the United States Golf Association. There were about five clubs at the time, and they got together and they started putting together the rules of golf and what was allowed, et cetera, et cetera. So he did all of that um, as this fierce amateur. He also, one of his daughters married, and they, um, it's a Northeast Harbor name, Peter Grace Senior, Peter Grace Senior. Some of you know of the Graces and Grace family. That one of his daughters. So my feeling is he probably visited here, maybe at one time. I have no no record of that, but um, to play golf with his friend on his friend's course out there in Green, maybe. Um, but I wanted to tell you a little bit about 
one story that's in this book, The Evangelist of Golf, that'll tell you what kind of man C.B. McDonald was, kind of a sad story. But Peter Jr., his grandson, learned how to play golf and was a pretty good golfer. And he had just finished building the, building the National Golf Course. It's an unbelievably fabulous golf course. I've never played it, but I've always wanted to. It has a windmill on it that's sort of iconic and just a beautiful condition. A lot of the architects in America claim that's their favorite course. That's how they learn to design courses that they're designing. Uh, but anyway, his grandson said to his grandfather, I think I can drive that first hole, which is a park pool. And so um, the club members heard this, and they all followed Peter Jr. out there to the first tee. And his grandfather was sort of, he said, we'll bet $20 you can't do this, and you get three chances, three balls. So Peter hits two balls, and, and they don't go on the green. Then third ball, he just hit it perfectly. It hit in the rough, it bounced, it bounced, and it ended on the green. And the club members, of course, went crazy. And, you know, he stormed off into the club. He was so mad. Somehow that, that you know, it didn't make any sense. But he was so mad that they finally, the club members and Peter followed him back and said, you've got to pay it. You've got to pay up. So he took the $20. He threw it on the ground. He left. The next morning, what does he do? He disinherits his grandson. True story. This inheritance. Now, the great thing about the story is that Peter Jr. made more money in his life than he would have ever made, ever. You know, with, with the Grace Company. But uh, yeah, that's C.B. McDonald's. There he is. Um, this, Mr. Wick, this is a, uh, a British author who came over because he's married to one of C.B. McDonald's other wives. And this is the guy that beat our guy for in the final match of the U.S. Amateur in 1897. He's the winner. Our guy came in second. Then he won it again the next year when he played on his grandfather's court out in Chicago. So he was a great golfer. You know, he was his Steve McDonald's son-in-law. What I like about this picture, look what he's wearing. This is what amateur golfers wore back then. They wore ties. He's got a kind of a silly little hat. They've got a formal coat on. He's got plus fours that are just to die for. Look at those, those uh, <laughs> stockings and, you know, what, what have you. But Mr. Wickham is the, is the man that beat Thorpe, and he was a natty dresser, that's for sure. But they all were. Now, here we have an aerial shot from the 1920s that I got here in the library. And what you have is a picture of Greeny, and then there's Northeast in the background. And you've got the golf course. There's Mr. Thorpe's golf course, right here. Um, there's some nice, there's a book about Greeny Island that was written by one of the inhabitants of the island, it wasn't a Thorpe. And in the book, he talks about the British ambassador at the time, whose name was James Bryce used to roll from Seal Harbor to play golf on the Thorpe course, followed by a swing. They had a great pool, apparently. The Thorpe girls delighted in seeing him whiz down the pool slide, his white beard flying in the breeze. <laughs> Those were the days. Good for him for rolling over. It was like golf, though, I must say. Um, and then here we have... And what was his name again? Uh, this ambassador? Yeah. Uh, let's see if I got that. Bryce. Yeah, Bryce. James Bryce. Ambassador Bryce. B-R-I-C-E. B-R-Y. Let me just double check that. Yeah, B-R-Y-C-E. This is uh, the same era, you know, but this, you can see, you can see our course in the background. There it is. Yeah. There's the Northeast Harbor Golf Club in the background along with Mr. Thorpe's course. And you can kind of see what it took for him to go over and be the captain of the first course and start the club. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, visible is our course in the background. Thorpe would take his boat over to a dock near the golfing grounds. And it was there that he pegged out the first course for the Northeast Harbor Golf Club in 1895, 96. 
Various newspaper accounts testified to the club being founded in 1895, and by 1901, there were 200 members. <laughs> That's a lot. 200 members and a clubhouse they built. And they started acquiring land. And they started paying uh, you know, yearly fee for the use of some of the land. Um, so it was very popular. The original nine hole course was constantly being improved so that each hole would be unique and they wouldn't have to hit over an existing hole. You know, they, they separated them all. That's a little dangerous, but uh, it was typical on the island course that he built. And sometimes in the old, I was in Ireland playing on a golf course called La Hinch, and there was a hole where you had to actually hit over another hole, but they put somebody up there to kind of tell you it was okay to hit, because you don't want to hurt somebody, you know? Uh, and then, because of the library's uh, collection, we were able to find a picture. This has got blurred when I put it into the PowerPoint. That's his house on green, designed by Fred L. Savage of North East Harbor. Uh, it's just that it's a magnificent that he called the House Ravens Thorpe also. Um, so that's his poem out on Greedy. And then we have, it's hard to see, but we have the only pictures that we can find, photographed from the 1890s of the original clubhouse. And standing, it's from a collection, an album called the Marvin Album, Mr. Marvin is, I'm assuming that's who that is. It doesn't say so, but it's the Marvin family album. It's here in the library. And you can, you can make out this beautiful clubhouse where they had teas every week and people went to the clubhouse and schmoozed as well as played golf. Both the men and the women, the, men, the women used to play against Kibo as well as the men and other clubs at the time. Very, very popular up until around 1905. So there's Mr. Marvin. And there's a close-up of him. No hard to see, but look what he's wearing, right? There's his tie, there's his uh, straw hat, looks like. Beautiful coat, nice pants, holding a golf club. And you can see the clubhouse and how it kind of, my guess is this is storage. They had, uh, they had to have lawnmowers and uh, other things for the course, and it was all one deal. Um, eventually, uh, they basically ran out of money because people stopped playing golf. They were on to other things. The summer people loved to fail. And of course, the swimming pool was built and the tennis club was there and the hiking is still there. And there's just so much to do. It ran its course as a fad, if you will. And there, there were so few people playing that they, they actually sold the clubhouse and it was moved off site. I know where it is, but I. I didn't get permission to say that in the book. It's pretty nearby. <laughs> and, and as golf sort of lost, four or five to 10 people would play every year. And they keep it going. They would get the money up and they would pay the people who were taking care of the land and, and mowing the lawns or the, the creeds and things. And so they, they kept it going. And then what happened was in 1913, this amateur golfer named Francis Wilmet <clears throat> all of a sudden entered the US Open. This included professionals uh, from Great Britain, amongst other places. And he won. He beat them all. And golf was, again, it really spurred an interest in golf. All over the United States, people, you know, they watched the ticker cake parade and they, you know, this, this, this young amateur who lived across the street from the course, you know, he beat, he beat everybody. And so the people who were taking care of our nine hole course, sort of pegged out, all of a sudden people started to play again. And they said, we need a real course. We have to, we have to hire a golf architect and make nine holes that are better than what we have now. And in order to do that, they needed to incorporate. So in 1916, they filed through the state of Maine to become a corporation, the Northeast Harbor Golf Club. And they got it and they were they they petitioned that they wanted to sell fifty thousand dollars worth of stock at a hundred dollars a share. And 
Hmm. Oops, go back. That's what the share looks like. That person bought two shares in, uh, in 1960, and they sold enough shares that they were able to um, hire an architect, and I'll get to that in a second. But I wanted to honor the five directors. These are the five men who kept it open, worked tirelessly to keep the club here in Northeast. And um, I have I have a sidebar in the book on each of them, but just very briefly here. Here they are. Laney. <laughs> this is Mr. Distin, Jacob Distin. He was one of the uh, the first directors of the club. He was family. His family was from Philadelphia. They owned the Henry Disson and Sons Corporation, a renowned manufacturer of hand saws, files, and other tools. He was married to Effie Fleming. They had eight children and a large number of grandchildren and great grandchildren, some of whom are still members of the club. The Dissons also contributed a lot of land. For the, to the club, as well as the current clubhouse. That was their, their house that they donated back to the club. Then we have John Archibald Murray. He was a prominent New York City lawyer. He married Alice Amelia Emily Rathbone, daughter of General Brigadier John Finley Rathbone and his wife Mary. The Rathbones had been summering in the Northeast and that drew Murray and his wife to build their own cottage, which they named Alder Lee. He also built a fairly famous house in New York City on East 66th Street in kind of an interesting factoid. It was owned by Andy Warhol from 1974 until Warhol's death in 1987. Mm -hmm. I had to throw that in there. Mm -hmm. Then we have the treasurer of the first corporation, William Draper Lewis. He was from Philadelphia. He graduated with both a law degree and PhD in economics from Penn. He served as editor of the American Law Register and became a dean and professor of law at the University of Pennsylvania. He pioneered the development of the case system of teaching law, which is still used today. He was a friend of Teddy Roosevelt and was an unsuccessful candidate for governor of Pennsylvania in 1914 for the Bull Moose Party. <laughs> yep. <clears throat> and we have John J. Pierpont. John J. Pierpont was a Brooklyn businessman and financier who, with his brother, took over the family business that Pierpont stores when their father retired. He was also on the board of the Northeast Harvard Tennis Club. He died tragically of heart failure while sailing his single masted boat known as Alert on a trip back from Northeast to New York City in 1923. Last but not least, we have the president of the corporation back in 1916, Paul Carlton Howard Yarnall from Philadelphia. He joined his father in the firm Ellis Yarnall and Son, importers of Sodash. He and his wife, Anna Britton Coxey, had three daughters and a son, and with some descendants, they're still members of Northeast Harvard Golf Club. I think that's great. He served as a director on a number of for-profit and non-profit boards in Philadelphia and was one of the founders of the National Episcopal Church Pension Fund. So here they had some money and they had a lot of interest in playing golf. So they hired an architect. And there is a picture of Mr. Arthur G. Lockwood. He was born in England and already was an accomplished golfer. He came to America to attend Harvard in hopes of studying medicine, but dropped out early after only one year to return to his passion playing golf. He won the inaugural Massachusetts State Amateur Golf Championship in 1903, again in 1905 and 1906. The competitor he beat in the first state tournament was, can I call him our? J.G. Thorpe. <laughs> so they knew each other. 
they knew each other pretty well because they were competitors in the Boston area. And I mean, I he was Thorpe was still on the board in 1960 of our club. So he had a natural person to turn to to design courses because Lockwood had then gone into the business of designing courses, which got him in a lot of trouble. You can't be an amateur and make money in golf, remember? He he pushed the envelope. He did it a lot and got caught some of the time. He stopped competing in 1917. It just got to be a, too much of a burden. He really wasn't an amateur by the definition that he had to live by. Uh, and that may be one reason why his work was lost a little bit at Augusta Club here in Maine and at our club. He didn't want anybody to know. <laughs> I would have trailed pretty well. It wasn't until I found the legend books and saw that he was paid and not Donald Ross, that he was the one that designed what we call the inner nine, the first nine holes, the nine holes that lasted throughout the history of the club from 1916 on. Those holes have always been in use and are still being used. Um, he, I mean, he also designed a lot of other uh, courses. What happened was they wanted him, when golf became so popular uh, that even our folks couldn't take the traffic, they needed nine new holes. They asked him to do another nine new holes. And he had gone on and moved to French Lick, Indiana, home of Larry Bird, by the way. French Lick, Indiana, French Lick Springs is the name of the golf course. Uh, and Donald Roth had been designing courses for them. And then he took over and was designing courses. He was too busy. I had a telegram that he sent back and said, I'm sorry, I can't do the next nine holes. Just but keep me informed who you do hire. Oh, uh, curiously enough, while he was here in 1916 designing our course, he also designed nine holes for Tebo. This laid out by Arthur Lockwood, Boston. And I believe that there's a date on it. Yeah, 1960. Well, at the Kibo locker room, you can see this in the hall, the whole the bigger picture. And I just, no one can really tell me why they were never used. They didn't use it at all. But he designed it while he was here, uh, <coughs> doing Northeast and doing Augusta. <clears throat> So we need, and there he is with Francis Womet. Womet chose him to accompany him on his tour of Great Britain and France. He chose Arthur Lockwood to be his kind of chaperone because he was from, uh, from Europe and um, he was a good guy. And, and Womet met him while he was competing in that famous tournament. And it was, a, it was a horrible weather on the last day. It was raining really, really hard. And apparently he gave him some advice that made a big difference according to Womet, what Womet said about Lockwood. So he just, uh, he accompanied him on this tour. So in order to build the second nine holes, we uh, we hired Herbert Bertram Strong out of the New York City area. His nickname was the Strong Man. He was just over five feet tall, but he was reputed, he could hit the ball along the way. In fact, he had a hole in one on a par four. So that means, you know, that's pretty rare. Uh, so Herbie, the strong man, and uh, when Lachlan was not available, they turned to him. Uh, he was also originally from England. He was also an accomplished golfer working in the New York City area. Um, he designed a course called Engineers Club. And it's where the, the PGA of America was founded. And he was one of the officers. And they played their PGA championship on his course. And then 1920, the next year, this was in 1919, when the PGA was formed, they used his course. In 1920, the USBA had their amateur championship, also on the engineer's course. Um, and the papers of the day called it one of the hardest, if not the hardest lengths the player had ever played on. So he had a reputation in designing very difficult holes. He's designed uh, courses in Ohio, Pennsylvania, Virginia, Florida, and Canada. Tom Doak, who's a famous architect in today's world of golf, wrote about Strong, and he said that many of Strong's holes could be called two or 20 holes 
<laughs> Meaning that you might get 30 at one of these holes, but you might just as easily get a 20. <laughs> because he had the habit of positioning steep drop-offs on the sides of his greens. And if you play Northeast, think of the 11th hole, think of the 12th hole, think of the 16th hole. They all have that imprint of being two or 20 holes. Uh, but that's, that's perfect strong. And, you know, his course was finished in 1925 into the 26th season. And we played 18 holes up until World War II. There was 18 holes maintained and played at Northeast um, until World War II. They ran out of money and they didn't have the, the people to take care of the course or the number of players to justify keeping it open. Uh, I found this um, this artifact. Well, now first I'll show you how hard it was to build strong holes. This is Irv Mollich, and he was in charge of the ground keeping. And there he is with his oxen. Uh, and this is what he was facing with. Come on. Oh. Check that out. And you golfers in the Northeast, this is the 10th hole. Wow. We're looking, wow. we're looking from the tee, yeah. and you can sort of see the ninth hole through the trees there. This is what he had to clear. Oh, no wonder he had oxen. And, and some kind of skitter, I guess. Um, and then here's another goal. Pick oh, that up. I mean, just all the trees and everything go wrong there. Uh, just making those particular nine holes so we could have snake and hole golf source. And here is a map that exists in the clubhouse today. You can see it if you come into the clubhouse. And this, this is the, the 18 holes. You'll notice that here's the clubhouse. The first hole is right off the clubhouse going straight up. This is now the 16th hole. This was the second hole, it's now the 17th, and finally the 18th, but that was the third hole. And then you have Lockwood's nine, and then you have Strong's nine. So uh, the map is kind of interesting because You'll wonder what it was like to start on what we call 16. That was the first hole. And here we have a caddy badge. <laughs> the, the, the ledger book that I found at the Historical Society from 1926, when 18 holes were now an option, it shows fees for the rental of a wharf off Stone's Down to ferry the caddies from across the sound to the club wharf. So we paid for a wharf in order to be paid for a, a ferry because they wanted caddies. There was also a paid position of caddy master and class A and class B caddies. This badge that I found is a class A caddy for 18 holes and A caddy was paid 75 cents. <laughs> and if carrying double, a dollar and a quarter. <laughs> Um, so, so we have this 18-hole course, and then we go back to nine holes at the beginning of World War II, and it stayed nine holes basically into the 1970s. I mean, the year-round of people would go in the winter in clear land because they were trying to get the course to come back, and it's, it's all in the book documented, but... Uh, you know, basically, we were nine holes. Then three holes were put on for a couple of years, so we were 12 holes, and then 15 holes for many, many years, from 1977 to 1993-94. It was 15 holes. And then we, we cleared those last three holes, and we were back to 18. There's a picture of Rob. Rob was a, the club pro for 38 years. Wow. He was beloved. And uh, he had the gift of gab, and, and he uh, he was like no other, that's for sure. He ran a caddy program for the scramble. Uh, and other times you could have a caddy. I remember using a caddy back then. They had various nicknames. My favorite nickname is the animal. <laughs> he was my caddy. And Billy. There's Rob. He was passionate about teaching golf and 
getting people to enjoy golf. As they say, he was there for 38 years. Most of the time, it was 15 holes, but he led the resurgence back to having 18 holes again. And he helped design a little bit of the 17th hole as well. And just because this is Rob's grandfather, Robert Abbey Gardner, his grandfather, an iconic multi-sport athlete, best known for winning the U.S. Amateur in golf twice. He was only 19 when he won the U.S. Amateur, which stood up until Tiger Woods. Nobody that young ever won it again until Tiger won it. Um, and he played against all the greats. He played against Bobby Jones, beating him and losing to him in various tournaments uh, all the way through the 1920s. Uh, at one point, he also held the World Pole Vault Championship, the record in the pole vault. I wanted to write a book about his father, his grandfather. No one's ever written about him. He was also a national champion in racket tennis. So the best thing, I think, my favorite little, little story about him is that he got into Yale. He'd already been the national golf amateur champion, but they wouldn't let him play on the golf team at Yale. Wow. Freshmen weren't allowed to play. He had to be sophomore. <laughs> Can you believe that? <laughs> he had to wait for he was a sophomore to be on the young golf team. Just one of these other interesting factors. Uh, we have a picture that Cliff loaned me. Uh, that's uh, that's Doug Kerr, who was his assistant groundskeeper back in the back in these days. Uh, this was October of 1987. He's finding the old first green. They're finding where it is. There it is. And there's the bulldozer clearing it. And then putting the sand down. He's raking the sand. And if you ever played the 16th hole, that's how small it used to be before. They, they've been large since then. Uh, there's a the great hook. This is, you can see grass is now growing up there on that sand. But the water that was in the brook that, that continues was above ground. They had to figure out a way to put a big culvert in there to get that water under the ground. Uh, that's what they were dealing with. And in fact, here you can see they built a, uh, a grid and they're starting to do that drainage work. But look at how they made the fairways and they've got a tee back there. And you can see the green. green. And eventually the way it looks today, is this that's uh that's from just a couple of years ago and you can see the granite rocks which they exposed and from that side you can see kind of pink colors of the granite uh, and that's that's now been restored as 15. um there the second half of the book talks about every hole in the course and the plaque that's on each hole. This is my favorite hole, number five. Um, I don't play it very well, but but you can see Ensley Fairman, it's his hole. And the, in fundraising, they, they, they ask for people to donate so much money and you can buy a hole. And if you play Northeast, every sometimes there's more than one plaque. There's a woman's plaque and a men's plaque out there. Uh, this is Mr. Fairman's hole. And, I played golf with Mr. Fairman years ago, and so it means a lot to me to, to know the family a little bit, but also to see the plaques on the holes, and that's that's in the book. Um, also, in the second half of the book, there's three shots for every hole. There's a tee shot, the tee shot of number one. There's a mid shot, and there's a green shot, and various ways to play the chords and statistics and who the architect is happens to be Lockwood. Um, there didn't used to be a pond there, and the book talks about all the all the tales of trying to make that pond and get rid of all the nasty stuff they had to dig out of the pond. That's in the book. Um, and then, how are we doing on time? Oh, oh, good. Last but not least, two clubs that use barn share. There's the Chicago Hunting Club with Stevie McDonald, barn share, and there's the Royal Liverpool Golf Club, known as Hoy Lake. It's where they had the British Open, what we call the British Open, they call it the Open. Um, last summer, Barnes, I kept waiting for them to say Barnes, I didn't hear it. But it means something to us. 
So anyway, there it is. There's a, a review of the book. And um, I'm happy to take any questions you might have either on Zoom or here. Yes. I always wonder, why do the men wear the, um, the jackets? They look like jackets. I don't know what they're Plus four. Okay. Was it I have no idea. I have to go into the history of fashion, I think, to find that answer. And I'm sure it's there. But it was to, to show their status, I guess, in, in golf, to, to show that they were gentlemen in golf even though they were betting back then against each other just as much as they do today. Oh, they were tweed and... No, they wore them in Scotland. What's that? They wore them in Scotland. They wore them in Scotland, yeah. Maybe the reason, I don't know if anybody's had experience, but if you wear long pants and they've been rainy, um, are the rest of the reason been kind of frustrating, you will find that around your cuff, you have lots of grass. That's for sure. And if you wear... Ankle socks and shorts or a skirt, and you don't have that happen. So maybe with those kinds of socks, that those ladies stare at us. Yeah, and those you, I don't know. They um, it has to do with it's not probably a pretty interesting answer that the the business of wanting to look like a gentleman on the golf course and wearing this heavy. I mean, they had the swing with they had ties and everything else, mm -hmm. and tweed. Pants and, and I don't know. It's just it doesn't exist like that anymore. Thank goodness. <laughs> As anybody out in Zoom land have a question that you find? No. Okay. Oh, that's fine. That's good. Maybe there are none. Maybe I covered it all. <laughs> yes, lady. Why? Why did they go to knock off with one, two, and three when they went to the two team hall? What What was the point of? I think, I mean, all of those strong holes, the second nine holes, in which those three were also Herbert Strong, um, were the hardest to maintain. Mm -hmm. They were, they, you know, they cost money to do that. And so somebody said, we just, let's just get back our original course. Let's don't make it some of his and some of, you know, that's the only thing I can come up with is that if you think of the other six holes, they are crazily way out there and difficult to maintain and longer, a couple parts, four, fives. Those three holes, I'm not sure the answer really, except that they were too difficult to do anything less than getting rid of all of Herbert Strong's holes, turns out. I mean, the other ones are pretty flat, more flat, more centered. These were kind of far field, but I don't know why they did that. And they were the last ones to be resuscitated, mm -hmm. <laughs> brought back from you know not existing. Yeah, Jim. Greg, why did they um, put the ninth hole, the furthest hole from the clubhouse? Most golf courses <laughs> <laughs> the ninth hole to be close to the clubhouse. Well, the actual history of golf is just the opposite. There's, if you look at the old scorecards, there's out and in. And the out was as far from the clubhouse as you can get, just like in our course. And then the 10th hole is, is in. That was the real tradition, the same as St. Andrews and the other courses. You, you went out and you came in, none of this clubhouse business. <laughs> you brought your own stuff and put it, you, put, you put your flask in your bag. Uh, yeah, it was out and in. So it, to me, it makes sense. You know, Kibo was that same way. Out and in, if you think if you ever played Kimbo. A lot of the old courses, certainly the British and Irish courses, it's not that there's not that convenience with people in carts, right? <laughs> Going and getting things and coming back out, you know. Well, I just have to here's the I just learned this. You know, there are a lot of people that walk that play golf. I'm one of them. Uh, and then there are people that take carts. Well, the carts in America, you know when it started as a big fad? Yes. Eisenhower. We can blame it on Eisenhower. He had his own cart. It was a little cushion cart. Only held him. It wasn't a two-seater. And Life and Look magazine all the pictures of Ike in his cart. <laughs> so that he was responsible. People said, I need one of those. Yeah. Well, I read that it started with FDR because he was a big golfer. And when he was paralyzed, he still went to watch the pro tournaments. 
So yeah. we would send a card. It's for the built little areas where he could drive and people that oh, okay. you know around the courses to watch the game. That's very interesting. I hadn't I hadn't read that. I just my recent thing was played. Not late, I'm using the word play. They were saying attributing it to all the publicity that Eisenhower got playing golf, which was he played many, many more rounds than Trump. Maybe not too many more, but he loved golf. He loved golf. And he was always in that same card. But the FDR makes sense. But did he actually play or just watch? Well, he was there. Right. But he just watched. Oh, he watched the Yeah. So then, you know, somewhere. The show still burned. And then, yeah. Before he was, uh, before he was crippled with polio, he played golf when he was younger. So it's still a course there. That's great. Wow. I'd love to see that course. Yeah. Um, the foreign shore in the book you said it uh, came 1681. Oh, that, that was a specific reference to um, to a house that they actually put a flat above the house called Foreign Shore. It's in it's uh, it's in Edinburgh, and what happened was a very wealthy man uh, was challenged. Uh, it's one of the, the, I don't have it in front of me, but it was one of the princes or whatever. Uh, it's funny because you could be you could be like Charles of Britain or somebody else from Scotland. It's the same person. You have two different. Anyway, he, uh, he was challenged to a match and he chose a commoner to be his partner. He went and said, who's the best golfer around? And they, they said, well, use this guy. And they won the match against these two royals, two other royals. And as a gift to this guy, he gave him a house in Edinburgh, and he had inscribed above the foreign ship. Okay. It's still there. You want to go visit? That, that, that's the theory thrown to back in the 60s. You're right. But the, the expression probably comes even before that. But that was to show how important it was. Put it on a house discussion. Foreign ship. Yeah. And, and a little cool golf club. When was that started? I'm not sure the exact date, but it's one of the earliest clubs in Great Britain, definitely. You know. So, 18th century, 19th century. Oh, they probably get it wrong. It was definitely in the 1800s and 1700s. I don't know if it goes back to the 1600s or not. Nor the provenance is at Old Tom Morris, because he, he designed a lot of courses in Ireland and, and in Scotland and Great Britain. I don't know much about the provenance. Of that particular club, yeah. Um, <clears throat> most people are familiar with why it's called plus the worst. I'm not the quote of the other one is called plus twos. Oh, plus two. What's, what's the fours? What's the plus well, plus four means it's uh, four inches below the knee, two in plus two for two inches below the knee. <laughs> okay. I love that. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> Um, yes, Tad. Craig, who do you think the best designed hole at Northeast Harbor is? There's a lot of them at Northeast, but uh, yeah, I, 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 I like short par fours, and that's why I picked number five as one of my creme de la creme short par fours, you know, that I can think of. I really, really love that particular hole. Do you miss the tree? Yeah. I do miss it. <laughs> and apparently, originally, uh, there was no tree it, it, back in the day when it was designed. And the rumor has it that they're getting rid of a lot of the infield trees this winter. <laughs> Stay tuned on that. Uh, yeah, I like that. I like 17. I think 17, which means uh, two, has got just a beautiful shape to it. And you'll see in the book that, that green had to be totally redone. Uh, so that's one of my favorite design holes. I don't play that one very well either. <laughs> Every time I get to it, I like it. And I'll say, I'll say maybe the most sensational hole in the whole course is 12 to part three. But you see those gold posts and, those, and that's the one that's on the front here. Uh, well, we're looking back at six. Right. But that's a beautiful hole. That's a beautiful hole. And, the, you know, one is a Lockwood hole and, and two are, are strong holes, but that's what's yours. 
Oh, 17, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It just, it's really wonderful. You know, that's a great hole. Uh, mine is 13, especially in the fall. Oh, my goodness. Oh, 13. Well, that's a big one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's beautiful coming down there. Yeah, I think I've had that design of that, what they had to do to make that happen, right? Frankly, there's something called the ladies' tea. So the forward piece. That's a beautiful tea. I wish that I hit the mat tea every time. <laughs> oh, really, that's that's great. That hit a little well. Yeah. That may have been my theory is that that was the tea we all use because that's where the steps are. Yeah. So you play six, you don't go up in there, you go down to the forward tea. I think that was the, the, the real goal. Then they added that one on top. I'm guessing, just like they've added one on four, you know, the, the Mahaney hole, that's way up there. We talked about it for years, and all of a sudden, there it is, R5. <laughs> well, I want to thank everybody for coming. Uh, I so appreciate it. Thanks for joining well, Yeah. Yeah. Could I ask